warm water. and yeast. So I'm going to get started making the orange roll recipe. And typically I would do this in the mixing bowl, but I am going to bloom my yeast right in this little container of water. And we'll get that started and then we'll talk about all the other delicious ingredients. Perfect. Okay, let's talk about yeast for just a minute while I'm mixing this together. I am using active dry yeast. Actually, today I'm using instant yeast, sack instant yeast. So I found that at Costco. And who, raise your hand or comment if you use the packets of yeast that you buy at the grocery store. I use bulk yeast, and so I measure mine by tablespoon or teaspoon. And if you use the packets, I have the measurement for the packets in the recipe. It's two packets. So one packet of yeast is a scant tablespoon. And what scant tablespoon means, it's just a little less than a tablespoon. In my calculations, I calculated that it was about half a teaspoon less. So I use five and a half teaspoons of yeast for two packets of yeast. So if that helps, you can use active dry yeast. If that's what you buy, you can use instant yeast instant dry yeast, but for this recipe, I have not used rapid rise yeast. So rapid rise yeast is just processed a little bit so that it helps your bread rise faster. In some instances, you want that. But in this one, we want the gluten to develop and, and those air pockets to develop a little slower in the process. It creates a nice flavor for bread. And so we're using these yeasts. You can mix the yeast into the flour, into the dry mixture, but you can also bloom it. So we're blooming it. This is a nice little safety. If you don't know if your yeast is too old or not, um, we, you can see if it bubbles and grows, and that means your yeast is active. So I like to put a tiny bit of sugar in my yeast while it's blooming, and you can do this in your mixer bowl at home. Um, sugar feeds the yeast. So it just kind of helps it activate a little bit and get all bubbly. Um, so we're gonna set that aside for a second and I'm gonna talk about the dough for a little bit. So we're going to make a soft roll dough. There's a question about yeast. Okay. Um, Dallin asks, how exact does the yeast measurement need to be for this recipe? New York City has no yeast. I had to borrow some from mom. <laughs> Not sure how exact she measured it. Nice. Um, Okay, so use what you have. Um, if it's about, um, it'll probably need to be about one, two, three, four, at least four teaspoons. Um, that's two scant tablespoons, but it's a little bit less. So if you, you could probably get away with four teaspoons, but I would go for the five and a half if you've got it. Um, Another question. Beautiful. Yeah. It's a scant tablespoon, not a scant teaspoon per packet, correct? Correct. And that is on the recipe. If you print it out or look online, it says a scant tablespoon, which is about, I calculated it as about two and a half teaspoons. It's usually about two and three quarter teaspoons. But to Dallin's point, it's okay if you have like that quarter teaspoon less or more. Um, we just want you to have some yeast in there to develop that dough. Um, and I'm going to put one and a half teaspoons of salt. I'm going to get that ready. Because I'm in Utah and I love it, I'm using Redmond salt. Um, it's, an, it's got lots of minerals and things in it. And it's this beautiful pink color. But you can use regular table salt. If you only have kosher salt at home, which most of you probably just have table salt. But if you have kosher salt, I would add a little bit more salt. Maybe just a pinch more, an eighth of a teaspoon or something. Kosher salt is just... Uh, bigger grain and so you don't get as much anyway so salt does two things it flavors your roll in your dough but it also inhibits the yeast so we have sugar that helps the yeast grow and salt that inhibits it so you get this perfect rise he's taken out yeah well just maybe tipped tipped a little bit so we have our swap in rolls that just came out of the oven i'm so excited so let's get started mixing this dough and I can show you all about the process. So ask questions if you want. I can answer them later if I don't get to them. My yeast is blooming and growing. 
But for the time being, I'm going to add my warm milk to my mixing bowl. If you don't have a mixing bowl, don't worry. You can do this by hand really easily. You can um, just stir it with a wooden spoon or a spatula, and I'll show you the texture in just a minute. And then you'll be able to see what, what results you'll want to get. So I'm putting in four tablespoons of soft butter. It's at room temperature. So that's a great thing to know. You don't want to put cold butter in this recipe, and you don't necessarily want to put um, melted butter in either. You want that nice, soft butter texture. It helps with the texture of the dough. I'm going to add sugar. Do I need to tell you the measurements, guys? Let's see. I will tell you. It's a quarter of a cup of sugar, which I pinched out in the yeast a little bit, and one cup of warm milk. And I'm going to do two eggs room temperature if you can, and the one and a half teaspoons of salt. So that's going in, that's going in. I am going to show you my little trick with eggs. When I add eggs to yeast dough, I like to mix them up just a little bit. Kind of like, um, thanks. I have all my assistants. Mary and Marie are behind the scenes. So I just mix these up, you don't have to beat them or anything too vigorously. But this just mixes into the dough a little bit better so that when you add the flour, the flour doesn't just mix with the egg. The egg's already mixed in with the rest of the dough. Otherwise you'll get little bits of pasta dough in your bread dough. No, you won't. It's not that bad, but um, that's just a helpful thing when you're making these dough. So my yeast looks nice and bubbly. I didn't give it the full five minutes. But I'm going to add it in because I know it's active and bubbling, and I've softened it. Another thing with yeast is when you have your water, we're using a quarter cup of water this for this recipe, and you sprinkle your yeast over that quarter cup of water, you want to stir it a little bit because you want all of those little grains of yeast covered and coated with water. Otherwise, they won't activate or they'll wait to be activated until they get into this milk and then you'll have clumps of yeast and you just won't have that nice, smooth mixture. So, any questions coming in? Mm -mm. Okay, oh, I keep going for the trash and we've got cooling rolls on there. Um, all right, let's put the dough hook on and then we're gonna measure our flour. So this week, I showed you guys how to measure flour last week in the, um, cinnamon roll recipe, but I'm going to show you again because there's been a few questions this week, mostly about my chocolate chip cookies where people have added too much flour and they're not spreading, they're not soft. Um, and so if you are choosing not to sift your flour and then measure it, there are a couple of ways that you can do it. So one is to, if you have a bag or a bowl, I pour it into a bowl or something bigger, Kind of lightly scoop and this is my cheats sifting so I'm just kind of lightly fluffing that flour and then what I'm going to do is lightly scoop that fluff flour I'm not going to tap it in just lightly scrape off the top to get my even flour now one cup of flour should be four and a quarter ounces and if you have a kitchen scale you can test yourself um, and then you'll know what it feels like to have a nice light um, cup of flour. Four and a quarter. Okay, I've been practicing. So I tested myself this morning to make sure that my fluffing was giving me the accurate measurement, and it is. So my hand can sort of tell how heavy or light that cup of flour is. And I got another four and a quarter. So you can pretty much, the other option is to spoon your flour into your cup. So you would lightly spoon flour in. I think this does heavier flour because you haven't fluffed your flour. A question. Yeah. Is the roll recipe today different than the rolls for cinnamon rolls? Absolutely. And I will tell you why. Good question. Let's see how much this one is. I'm going to zero this out. Three and three quarters. I was a little bit off. I'm going to add a little more. But that's good. It was lighter rather than heavier. So 
For this recipe, I used about four cups of flour, so I'm just gonna finish measuring that. The dough for this is not the Japanese milk bread dough. So that was unique to the cinnamon rolls because I wanted a sort of silkier, chewier, um, moist roll for the cinnamon rolls. It's just that quintessential cinnamon roll bite that you want. Um, these are more like a grandmother's butterflake rolls. And really this is a butterflake roll recipe with the orange flakes um, instead of just butter. So I'll talk more about butterflake later as I'm rolling out. Um, but this one, will ha it has eggs in it, it has milk, it has sugar in it, which last week I talked about no sugar is in Japanese milk bread because it kind of pulls some of that moisture out. Well, in this one, it helps with the eggs and the milk to enrich that dough and make it kind of sweet because we're not adding a lot of the brown sugar and things to the inside. So you could probably, we could experiment and make um, orange rolls with the Japanese milk bread. But I love these. They melt in your mouth. They're so light and airy. You'll see when I show you. Okay, I'm going to mix this up and feel free to type in any questions while the machine's on. I'll talk loud. But I have my softened yeast, my warm milk, my two eggs at room temperature, my quarters cup of butter, and oh, no, four tablespoons butter and a quarter cup of sugar in here. Delicious. I'm going to let that mix a little bit and start adding my flour. This dough is really sticky and light and soft. It's not like a bread dough where you'll be able to handle it with your hands. So if you're hand mixing it, it will be very sticky, almost like a batter until you add all the flour. And then it will just be a sticky dough. So I like to add about half of the flour and let it mix with those wet ingredients because what it does, the butter gets nice and smashed up and everything gets mixed really evenly while this small amount of flour is mixing. I'm going to scrape down the sides of my bowl. And I know this week I'm not going to show you inside my bowl until after I've mixed it, but I will describe it. So right now I have a very battery situation with my flour. And I want those two cups of flour to really mix in and create that soft batter. Any difference is using a Bosch or a KitchenAid mixer? No, the Bosch is really nice and powerful, so choose your speed so it's not kind of going crazy. Um, let's see. I think you could use the, what do you use for the Bosch? The dough hook. I think you could totally use the dough hook. Um, you may need to get about three cups of flour in there for it to mix. Um, but they're both great. So I'm just more familiar with this and both work. Okay, so in the recipe I give a range, three and a half to four cups of flour. And that is because it gives leeway for how you're measuring your flour, what the moisture is in the air, all of that jazz, how dry it is where you are. And so I'll show you the texture of the dough you want. I've made these several times and I use all four cups of flour. So you probably will too, unless it's extremely dry where you are. Or you use extra large eggs, um, and you might even need a touch more flour or something like that. I use large eggs, so. So I'm going to let all that flour get incorporated into the dough before I add more so it's not a big dry ball in there. And I can see the dough is kind of pulling away from the sides and the gluten starting to form. So there's sheets of dough that sort of pull away from the sides. And if you're doing this by hand, <laughs> probably won't make a mess like that. Um, you'll get some, some really good arm muscles. Because each time you add flour, it'll get a little more stiff and a little more stiff. And you'll probably want to use that motion of just kind of lifting the dough over itself. Marie has a question for you. It's actually just my oh, personal good. question. Um, mixing speed. Yeah. Does that matter 
or how do you determine? I mean, I know you don't want it flying out of the bowl, but. That's really what it is, good question. So I started out kind of medium speed so that I can get everything mixed. And then obviously I should have turned it down a little lower while I was adding that flour. I like to think to myself, if I was kneading this dough myself or stirring it, what would my speed be? Mm. And you can turn it up just a little bit more than that. Um, this dough, because we're not kneading it for like eight or 10 minutes, we can keep it on sort of a medium, medium high speed um, instead of a big high speed that we really want to get that food for me. So it looks about right. I have all the flour in there. And it's pulling away from the sides a little bit. It's kind of gathered into like a mound at the bottom. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. Let's see, I'll put it in here, you guys. So this week I want to have a nice greased bowl for my dough. Because it's such a nice soft dough, we want to treat it with gentle care. So as you can see, that's quite a sticky dough. But once we gather it into a ball, it will be kind of nice. Can you see that with that ball in the way? That's what I'm trying to figure out. So a bit of a sticky dough, but you can see how it kind of sheets that gluten has, has formed. So there's some, some dough sheets there. So you can use your hands, or I like to do a spatula because cleaning dough off your hands is often not that fun. And then I'm going to scrape it into this bowl. And you can use a spatula, or I love these dough spatulas. You, they kind of are an extension of your hand. And I have a link to them. They're so cheap, you can get several of them for like three or four dollars on Amazon. There's a link on the recipe page. And I just scrape that out, you can see I've only got a little bit left in there that I'll scrape out and get that on here. Then I can, because the bottom of that bowl is greased, sort of lift this up around forming a beautiful little bowl, or ball, <laughs> bowl, in the ball, in the bowl. And then I like to turn that over. Then the top of your dough is nice and greased and it's sitting in a nice greased bowl and that will help it to rise evenly and not stick to the sides or anything like that. Thank you. I've got plastic wrap coming at me. You can cover this with a towel or plastic wrap. I prefer plastic just because I don't want that dough to dry out at all. So it will be nice and snug right here. So the other thing is depending on if you're using instant dry yeast or active dry yeast, there's a range of rising time. And if your house is cold, if your house is warm. Um, so this, it's what's, um, we probably put it in a sort of warm oven that was maybe 90-ish degrees. And it took about 45 minutes to rise. So if it's a little cooler in your house or you don't have an extra oven to put it in, it will maybe take closer to an hour or a little bit longer. But there's your nice soft dough. It's softer than that cinnamon roll dough that we made last week. And we'll set it aside to rise. So I'm gonna straighten up here a little bit and then I'll show you the next process. Two questions. Um, the first one is why is it that you do not need to knead the dough for a long time and do you grease the plastic wrap? Oh, you no, I don't grease the plastic wrap on this one because um, the dough's already greased on top, and it's not, it probably won't even rise to the top of that bowl. It just is going to double in bulk, which isn't quite that high. Um, and the first question was, why don't you need it? I need it a long time. Mm -hmm. um, it's a softer, lighter dough. And basically, I don't want to toughen it. I don't need to create more of those gluten strands by kneading it and kneading it and kneading it two long rises is 45 minutes and then once when they're rolls is going to be plenty for um, that gluten to form and then it stays light and tender and there's not as much flour or structure for the gluten to hold up does that make sense it's not super scientific but that is 
why. Okay. Oh, you know what I didn't do, guys? I didn't put the orange zest in the rolls. Was somebody going to ask? Yes. Something? Can you repeat how these rolls are different than sweet rolls? She, uh, it's from Stephanie, and she had to answer a call, so she didn't hear. Nice. So, yes, this is the sweet rolls were a Japanese milk bread roll, and they're a more hearty and rich, like thicker dough. And so they can hold that spiral of all that brown sugar and deliciousness. Uh, this is a much lighter, like an old fashioned butter flake roll. So just completely different textures, like a light, light dinner roll type of thing. Um, one tablespoon of orange zest was supposed to go in that dough. But we're gonna put orange zest in between as well. So it won't be terribly awful. Um, we did get orange zest in our swap out. So this dough I made, uh, about an hour ago, so it is ready to be rolled out, and I'll show you that next step. This is the fun part. This is where we get to layer it and have all of those laminated layers of butter and sugar and orange zest. Okay, anything else? Don't let me forget anything else I've missed. Oh, it's going to be fun to see what you forget next time. So you're forgetting something each time. What did I forget salt. last time? The salt. Did. You were going to tell them about washing the orange. Oh, I'll, I can do that when I do the frosting. But yes, I wash my orange with dish soap, just like I wash my hands. Just go over to the sink, kind of get a little scrub, rinse it off, and it's clean before I zest it. Because there's usually some wax or maybe some dust from the grocery store. And so I figure I wash my dishes and my hands with dish soap, so it's great for this. And you rinse it all off so it's perfect. Um, all right. Oh, I will. I'll show you how it, how it should look. Now, unlike those cinnamon rolls as well, I'm going to give this a generous amount of flour on my work surface. Uh, this dough is stickier, and it it is okay if it absorbs some of this flour. So that's... That's the deal. So this is ready. You can see that indentation stays in there and we can make a little smiley face. You can punch this if you have aggression, no big deal. But I like to just kind of dump it out on my floured surface. And then I release those lovely air bubbles with my fingers. So as I'm releasing the air bubbles, I just kind of shape it because I know I want to roll it into a rectangle and I'm just kind of pressing those air bubbles out. We want to press them out because we want them to reform when the rolls are all um, formed. Can you use clementine zest mm -hmm. if that's yes. all you have? Absolutely. And oh. this question, I don't know if it's the difference between like orange juice, it says and juice orange or navel. Are those two different? Uh, anything, orange, anything, honestly, anything. So any orange citrus, they can be blood oranges, they can be clementines, mandarins, um, tangelos, whatever you have. It's that orangey citrus flavor that you're going to get and the zest imparts it in the dough and the filling. And then in a minute when we make the frosting, you use the juice in the frosting. It's great. So, okay. See how I've already stretched this out pretty well. And this one gets rolled to about, what is it, 19, no, 18 by 14 inches. And if you don't have a ruler, eyeball it. Um, this is, these first few rolls are just fine to get it an approximate size because this is just our layering. <laughs> oh, well, Stephanie Zendel wants to know if you can use chocolate oranges. Chocolate oranges, do it! Oh my gosh, tell me how it goes. <laughs> I love it. Can you zest those very well? <laughs> okay. Oh, I didn't mix my filling, but I'm going to do that now. So this is about, I don't know, 14 by 18. And um, this is where the yummy um, filling comes in. And I will show you how I zest my orange. 
So the filling has five tablespoons of butter and three tablespoons of confectioner's sugar. Look how we have the labels. Even though we have the labels, I still forget things. Again, my butter is at room temperature. It's quite soft, and you don't want this melted. <laughs> is my, do I have flour in my face? Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was awesome. Yeah. I'm so glad I have assistance. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, you don't want to melt this butter. So we talked about this a little bit when we made cinnamon rolls last week, and you want the aeration of the unmelted butter for your um, for the inside because you want that um, you don't want it to melt and soak right into the dough before it creates those layers okay so I love it I'm using this microplane zester and just getting the outside of this orange because that's the nice flavorful part it has all the orange oils in it you don't want to get a lot of that white pit because that's the bitter part but some people I think you go like this I can't do that. <laughs> so tell me how you do it. Do you scrape the orange on the rasp or the rasp on the orange? I scrape the orange on the rasp. I don't know. It's just easier for me. It's kind of the same way. Like how do you feel vegetables? Do you feel them away from you or towards you? <laughs> anyway, you want about a tablespoon of orange zest in both the dough, remember it, and in this filling. That's where all the big punch of orange flavor is going to come from. And one decent sized orange is about a tablespoon of zest. So I'm going to bang this. Get all that awesome zest off the rasp. Set it aside. If you don't have a microplane zester or rasp, you can use that really weird looking side on your box grater or um, cut it off and chop it, whatever you want. Dallin uses his fingernails. <laughs> and then also there's a question. A lot of your recipes call for unsalted butter. Suggestions if all I have or can get right now is salted butter. Fair enough. I went to the store a few weeks ago and all the, there were two choices of butter and it wasn't like margarine and salted butter. No big deal. Um, you can just make the recipe straight and they'll just be a little more salty. Um, or you can reduce the salt just a touch in the dough. This will be fine if you have um, salted butter in it. It's just a slightly more salty flavor, really. Um, I'm going to use one third of this because you need to use this three times. So I'm approximating one third of this filling and I just smear it right on here. So the confectioner's sugar is sort of in place like if you were making um, spiral rolled rolls, you'd probably be um, sprinkling granulated sugar on, but we want this smooth, nice filling. No grains or anything like that of sugar. This is a fun, crazy part. So this gets folded over. This is the beginning of our lamination. So we'll just fold that over. And the dough is quite forgiving, so you can sort of shape it how you want. Beautiful. And then I'm going to do that second third and put it on half of this and it gets folded over. Then we're going to let it rest for a few minutes while we make the frosting and do a, our last lamination. That gets folded over. So that's beautiful. Now the step in the recipe says let this rest. Sure, you could start rolling this out right now and get your last lamination in, but we've worked this dough a little bit, and so we want it to relax again. So I think of it as my muscles. I just need them to relax, and then I can work out again. Um, but this will just let those, oh, look, I have an air bubble. We'll squish that out next time. Um, we'll just let it sort of soften, and then it will roll out really well without stretching back in, no, springing back in. So you don't want your dough to be tight because you want it to go in the direction that you want it to go. I'm gonna wash my hands. Okay, so while we let that dough rest, let's make the frosting, icing, drizzle, whatever you wanna call it. Um, 
And I'm going to use, I don't know what bowl I'm going to use. I'll go get a bowl. On the floor. So let me talk to you about the frosting. You can juice your orange that you just zested, which would be lovely, um, which I'm going to do right now. Or, it's very slippery, or you can use orange juice concentrate. So, I have a make-ahead option on these orange rolls, which means you might make them today and bake them next week or the next, and you won't have this fresh orange to juice. So if you've got frozen orange juice concentrate, just use that. Or if you have already made up orange juice in the fridge that your family drinks, use that. Um, but I keep, uh, if I open up an orange juice concentrate and I don't make it into a pitcher of orange juice, I just keep it in the fridge and you can spoon that into your frosting. I think, let's get a little bit more orange juice in here. And depending on how thin or thick you want your icing is how much juice you're going to add to it. So I think I've got plenty there. I don't mind about the pulp a little bit, but if you don't want any pulp, just strain that out. Um, and then, oh, that's my bench flour. Let's not use that. I'm going to use two cups of confectioner sugar. Sometimes I get questions, do I need to sift it? Sift it if you want. If your confectioner sugar has lumps in it, then you want to sift it. If it doesn't, most of those lumps will come out when you mix. Will you be explaining the freeze ahead aspect of this recipe? I'm all about freezing things for later. Devon. Yes, I will. And let me talk about that when I'm putting it in the muffin tins. And then we'll be on the same page and the same timing. Um, but yes, I'll talk about that, and I have all the tips and hints in the recipe as well. So my frosting, if I'm right, don't let me forget anything, is just confectioner sugar and orange juice. That's all it is. And so I'm going to add a little bit. You can measure this if you want. I gave you measurements. Oh, it's coming out all ends. Add a tablespoon or two, and then you can start to mix your frosting. I like my frosting a little thicker than thin because I like it to stay on top of my rolls rather than um, just kind of glazing it and going away. So if you're using orange juice concentrate, which we did the other day, it gives a really potent, delicious flavor to this icing. I just kind of mix this in. Like I said, if you have any lumps in your powdered sugar, they'll probably disappear while you do this. But if they're the hard, crusty lumps, you'll want to sift them out. Now you can see that's getting quite thick. And I can add a little more juice if I want to, but I want to get all of that powdered sugar in first. Let me see what my texture is. I like that. I mean, if I were going to put that in a bag and sort of pipe it on my rolls, it would be perfect, but I think I'll just add a splash more juice. I don't know where this is coming out. There we go. And then you have this beautiful orange flavored icing. And we can set this aside until we're ready. If you're setting it aside for longer than like five minutes, you'll want to cover it with plastic wrap. But um, mine's just going to sit here for a minute. So I will scrape down the sides and just set it aside for a second. That looks good. It's about, it's a little drizzly, a little bit thick. 
Okay, we are back at it, and this time we're rolling it out to 16, nope, 16 by 10 inches. So this one is a little bit more, you should pay attention to it, because once we do this fold, we're gonna have a certain shape, and that's how you get 24 little rolls. So I'm going to start rolling this out a little bit. And it's nice, it's not springing back because I let it rest for a little bit. Make sure you've got flour under there. I can hear some of those air bubbles like squishing out. It's lovely. Got a little more flour under here. Ooh, look, you can see that's kind of come apart right there, no big deal. Okay, I'm guessing we're getting close. I think we've got it, and a little more than 10 inches, but we'll fix that in a second. Okay, the last bit of your delicious filling goes in. This is our last lamination layer. So we're gonna have quite a few layers in these rolls because we folded and rolled and folded and rolled. And get that nice and even, every last bit. Then we're gonna fold that over. And you have your beautiful rectangle of dough. Now at this point, I'm gonna put on a cutting board so I'll show you why I like to use a knife to cut these rolls. If you have a butcher block, you don't need to put it on a cutting board because you can use a knife right on your butcher block. And this is where you can control the dough a little bit and get it to the shape that you want. We want this about 12 inches by two, four, six, eight inches. And I give these measurements in the recipe You'll be able to sort of figure that out from the recipe. So there's my 12. The reason being is that if I have 12 inches right here, I can do six rows and four rows and get 24 little rolls. So that is my plan. Beautiful. And I like to use a chef's knife. I'll show them how I do that. Yeah. So I've got muffin tins, just standard muffin tins, and you know what's so great? These were my great grandmother's, and she used to make these orange rolls in these muffin tins, and my mom has them, it's so lovely. She was, my mom said, she was known for her orange rolls. She would make them for the women's societies and gatherings and family gatherings, and they were these orange butterflake rolls in these muffin tins. So these are beautiful muffin tins. They've got a nice like rise and they're just great shape and they're heavy. Um, so we're using those today, which is super exciting. Colleen said, I remember your mama's orange rolls. Yum. Does she use concentrate or fresh? Concentrate. Mom uses concentrate for the frosting. Mm -hmm. And Holly wonders, any concerns with scaling the recipe to one and a half or two times as long as I have enough muffin tins. Should be fine, and also your mixer. You'll want to make sure you have room in your mixer, but it should be totally fine. Just for wielding the dough, you may want to divide it into half or thirds when you're working with it, but it should scale just fine. Um, okay, so as you can see, I've divided this, the 12 inches into six rows. They're about two inches each. And I just sprayed my little knife with a little cooking spray so it will go right in. And I go straight down and straight up, straight down and straight up. I'm not going to drag it, and I'll show you why in just a second. Straight down, straight up, straight down. Kind of like when you're cutting a baking powder biscuit. Um, you want to go straight in and straight up so that you get those flaky layers as it bakes. That's kind of what we're doing here. We have created some layers in these rolls and we don't want to smush them together. We want them to be nice, clean, 
layers. Okay, the next measurement is four rows across and we'll get 24 little rolls. Now if you want these to stick out a little bit more or puff up a lot more, you can make 20. You can do however many you want. Um, just you'll have to change the baking time a little bit. But I'm going to do this. Three and three. Straight up, straight down, straight down, straight up. No sign motion. Two questions. Yeah. Dallin wants to know if you could conceivably bake it as one large rectangle <laughs> and then would a pizza cutter smush it too much? Um, once it's out of the oven, I guess. No, once it's out of the oven, it's, it's, um, it's like bread. It's like stable. Oh, sorry. That was a separate question. Oh. Okay. So I don't know. You know what, Dallin, if you bake it all as one rectangle, <laughs> let me know how it goes. I don't know. It might not bake in the center. You wouldn't get the flakes. You wouldn't well, you see did. the flakes. You wouldn't see the flakes. You let me know how that goes. Um, and then pizza cutter, sure. Again, you'll want to grease it and you can experiment. So if you don't want to use a knife, um, you'll see how it either tears the layers or compacts them and you can switch to a knife but i'll show you i see one right in here that's beautiful and because i went down and straight up i have these beautiful layers and i can see them i'm not sure if you can on the camera um, and what i like to do is i pick up each square and i figure out which one is the most beautiful layers on top that's what i want the top of my roll to be so i just nestle that down right there nestle that down just gently into that baking cup so here's my corner one beautiful layers right there so I'm gonna make that my top and just kind of set it down in there and all along I'm gently working with this dough there's no need to squish it or anything like that um, oh my goodness beautiful layers on that side I'm just gonna nestle it in now these aren't the exact size each one they're slightly different. It just is like that. I'm not perfect. But um, so some of your rolls are going to be a little bigger than the others. But these are the most beautiful layers. These might be even prettier than the layers I made this morning. When you're placing them in the tin, are you smushing it down? Not so much smushing, kind of setting it. So here, let me show you the motion right here on the cutting board. Can you see right here? Yes. Okay, so I'm just kind of making sure it's flat on there and it, okay. it stays in the muffin tin. Otherwise, it falls over in the muffin tin and you won't get the layers on top. We have a request to zoom in on the layers. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to, no, I'm going to have to come to you. Okay. Because I don't think, we can't move the camera today, sorry. Okay, I have a good one though. Do you want me to I'm hold it? it to you. Yeah, okay, let's try it. Ah! Sorry, I'm amateur at this, guys. <laughs> it's the Facebook Live. If we were doing something different, we could have multiple cameras, but we don't. So these are already, okay, you can see already one of them fell over. So I'm just going to nestle that down on the bottom again so it stays up straight. This gets covered with plastic wrap and it gets uh, another rising session and then it goes in the oven. Here is where I'm gonna talk to you about freezing. So this is the point at which you would freeze your rolls. And this is why I like to have a few extra muffin tins around because I'll just put this whole thing, I wrap it really well right now before they rise, wrap it in plastic wrap. You can wrap it in foil as well on top of the plastic wrap and put it in your freezer. And then this whole thing comes out of your freezer and it will take two, two and a half hours at room temperature to thaw and then rise and then they go in the oven. So it saves you all that other time. It's very hands off and you can just pull them out. Now, if you don't have extra muffin tins, you can put these on a parchment lined baking sheet, cover them, freeze them, and then put them in a baggie and keep them in the freezer. There'll be these beautiful little squares and then when it comes time, you'll take them out, 
They'll be frozen and hard and you'll place them in your muffin tin and let them come to room temperature and rise. Now they won't, you won't be able to nestle those in. So they might kind of flop around because they'll be frozen, but they'll still be delicious and quite beautiful. How long do they keep in the freezer? You know, it is up to you. They could keep up to three months. Um, if they're wrapped well, they, it could be a month, it could be a week. Um, so you decide, I don't think, it depends on how much air circulation is in your freezer. I don't think if you wrap them well, they will um, stay nice and fresh and airtight. So, but they can, they can last a while. I have two trays, okay, these are ready to be covered and ready for their second proof. That will only take uh, about 30 minutes, depending on the warmth of your room. So those are going to go aside and we'll do that in a minute. But I have swap outs. So I'm gonna clean this up and bring them over. And Carolyn said, no wonder my rolls have always been so many different sizes. It's wonderful seeing how accurately you measure and cut them. Thanks. I love having a ruler in my kitchen. And I keep one in my kitchen drawer because, uh, well, I test recipes and I create them, right? So I need to get the exact measurements. If you want to eyeball, it's totally fine. But I like this because it just is easy to follow the recipe, measure my dough, and boom, I'm, I'm more accurate than I would be if I was eyeballing it. So. Dallin says hopefully until the end of the quarantine is when the, they can come out of the freezer. Oh yeah, perfect. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, we are going to ice some of these rolls. They're going to be so pretty. Okay, these were just baked about an hour ago. They came out of the oven when we started our video. So we tipped them up a little because usually you'll let them sit in here for a couple minutes and then take them out onto a wire rack. So we just kind of tip them so they don't get soggy. They're so light and airy. And you can see how these layers bake up. You want to show them? We'll manhandle these. We're going to eat them. I love it. All of them have their own little shape. Go ahead. And I'm showing you the layers. I love it. I hope that's focused. Who knows? But anyway, you can see that's why they're called butterflake rolls because these will pull apart in their layers. And if we had just put plain butter in there, it would have been a lovely dinner roll. But we put orange and sugar, and now we're going to ice them with our icing that I set aside. You can use a spoon. This is a little thick. You might want to thin it, but I'm just going to ice these rolls a little bit. We usually make double the icing <laughs> because we like icing. and. So we'll make them all pretty for the dinner table like this, and then we each scoop our own icing onto them. But you can just ice all of them. If you let that icing set for just a few minutes, um, then you can pile them in a basket and they look really pretty. Do you wanna just show them? I don't know, if you need to see a close up. But I need to eat it right now, because it looks so delicious. Look at those flaky layers. <sighs> It's so light and airy. And it's got a really good orange punch. And then the sweet icing on top is so divine. So I hope you guys make these. I hope you enjoy Easter. And if you're doing the fast tomorrow, my church is doing a, a worldwide fast for the COVID-19 and um, the economy and so everyone's joining together to humble themselves and fast for two meals. And if you want to join, join. There's lots of Facebook groups that you can get details. Um, so that's why we did this today. So we can fast tomorrow and eat these on Saturday. So if you have any other questions, let me know. Otherwise, type them in and I can answer them later.